There will be better days. 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 Welcome to this virtual service of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Waynesboro for Sunday, November 1, 2020. This fellowship is a welcoming congregation, accepting of all without regard for gender or sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, religious background, economic status, or physical challenges. Whoever you are, Wherever you come from, wherever you are on your life's journey, welcome. My name is Kay Yost, and I've been a member for about eight years. I serve on our worship arts team 
and on our auction task force, which is currently planning a totally online auction this year. Since last March, we have been unable to gather in person in our fellowship hall. So we are learning new technologies and new ways of interacting together and maintaining our traditions in new and creative ways. In opening this virtual service, I would like to share these words written by Cynthia Landrum. Apart but together. Spirit of life and love, we gather together in different ways this morning from computer screens, from telephones, from car radios. We gather reaching out across the wires, waving from a safe distance to come together in religious community. From living room to front porch to car seat, we gather as we are able, ready to be of service to each other, to the world, ready to build the community of hope and of love. As we face this bright morning, we are apart, but we are together, offering our love, our commitment, our hope, and our prayers in service to one another and this world. It is a new way, but an old way that we come together in worship today. The flaming chalice is a symbol of our faith. In keeping with our UU tradition, I share these words before the lighting of the chalice. Even as the days grow shorter and our homes shrink smaller and our wicks burn lower and our will to endure flickers, a lit candle in a jar on the sill of an open window we light this chalice to kindle a flame of warmth as a reminder of the connection that draws us into a community that opens us up in gratitude for the breath in our lungs and the love in our hearts for the gift of this day alive. Please join me in singing hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. Love will guide us, peace has tried us, hope inside us will lead the way on the road from greed to giving you can change the world with your love if you cannot sing like angels if you cannot speak before thousands you can children to the future of the world where we live love will guide us peace has tried us hope inside us will lead the way on the road from greed to giving you can change 
change the world with your love. Our meditation this morning is from the Prayer of Co-Creation by the Reverend Lynn Cox. Creative spirit, source of life and love, we give thanks for the beauty of this day and members of this community. Thank you for the breezes of change, clearing our heads and bringing fresh ideas. May they cleanse our minds of the oppressions and isms that divide us. Thank you for the flame of hope, the heat of righteous anger, the warmth of compassion, and the fire of commitment. May they bubble the cauldrons of transformation. Thank you for oceans of love, rivers of connection, tears of relief and pools of serenity. May healing waters flow over us and through us and among us, wearing down the sharp rocks of despair to bring joy in the morning. Thank you for the good earth beneath us, around us and within us. May we take this clay and co-create a new realm of justice and beauty. Thank you for all these and more. We accept our gifts and commit to building, sculpting, painting, singing, and dancing them to life, to abundant life. So be it. Blessed be. Amen. And now let us pause for a moment of silent reflection. Let us take time now to make space for those joys and sorrows, large and small, held by members of this congregation and the larger community. Although we're not together to share them in person, we hold them in our hearts.
No storm can shake my inmost heart. I'll do that rock I'm clinging. Since love prevails in heaven.
Hi, it's Debbie, and I have a reading for us today. It's called A Recipe for Resilience by Margaret Weiss. This recipe has been tweaked over time, so just as necessary. Sometimes it yields more servings than anticipated. Sometimes it needs a bit more of this ingredient or that. It comes from generations who have come before me, and I've added my own flavor along the way. A recipe for resilience. One part courage. Two parts tears of failure and doubt. One part deep listening. One part each of both silence and laughter. A dash of trust. A pinch of wonder. A heaping scoop of naps and snacks. In a separate bowl, mix together family, friends, and those who challenge you to be your best self and those with whom you disagree. Add slowly to the larger pot a bay leaf for what, well, whatever bay leaves do. And let simmer for as long as you need, which is often longer than anticipated or than you realize. Keep the heat at an even temperature, hot enough to cook throughout, but not so hot that it burns the bottom. It can be served at room temperature, warm, or even cold if necessary. Serve alongside your favorite soft blanket, a cat, a dog, or any other soft item. Make often, share with others, hold on to the leftovers because you'll need them after a long day that challenges your soul.
Good morning. Welcome to election week. This is a big week. I want to name that you may be holding considerable anxiety and stress because of the high stakes of this year's election. These are valid feelings to be sitting with. The two major parties appear to be at war with each other to the point where it seems impossible we would be able to address the pandemic, systemic racism, the environmental crisis, healthcare insecurity, or economic inequality. On some of these issues, it may even look like we're moving backwards. So I wanna say up front, I know that some of us are sitting with that right now. There's a saying often attributed to the Protestant reformationist Martin Luther that goes, if I knew the world would end tomorrow, I would plant a tree today. Now, in spite of the mess we've made with our fractured and divisive politics and short-sighted choices over the past four years and even before that, I don't think the world is gonna end anytime soon. I'm too much of an optimist and I have too much faith in people, but I do wanna talk this morning about planting trees. In the natural world, trees are metaphors for stability and endurance, so much so that the world's most iconic trees even have names. Among the towering redwoods is Hyperion, the tallest living thing on earth, standing 78 feet higher than the length of a football field. Travel to Utah and you can visit Pando, a quaking aspen colony identified as a single living organism and the most massive living thing on the planet. And an unnamed tree in the Western US has been dated to be 5,070 years old. It's been alive since before 3000 BCE, before the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, before the Bible was written, before the Egyptian pyramids were built, this bristlecone pine stood in what would become California's White Mountains. Yet trees grow from seedlings that belie the awe-inspiring potential they hold. You can buy seedlings for any of the three species of tree I just mentioned online for $20 or less. And when you plant a tree, you put it in the ground willing to wait wait for it to live into its potential, never knowing for sure what the future will hold. As Unitarian Universalists, as people of faith, I'd like to think that this idea of tree planting is in our nature, something we can do and do well as we live our values in the world. How might we bring this faith to life outside of our congregations? This is the question addressed by the field known as public theology. Public theology looks to use one's values to improve the world. Dr. Asef Ali, professor of Islamic studies and Muslim theology, says that it aims to make theology and religion relevant to the social order. Public theology gets out of the pews and into the streets, seeking the common good engaging in public dialogue and political issues and taking care of people. Perhaps the best known public ministry was that of Jesus of Nazareth, whose Jewish faith led him to renounce wealth and devote himself to ministering to the poor, the sick, to outcasts and the disenfranchised. In the United States, the public ministry of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr advocated for nonviolent protest against segregation and oppression based on his Christian understanding of agape, that we should love all children of God. 
at its best, Unitarian Universalist theology based on our seven principles that center human dignity, justice, democracy, peace, and our connectedness to each other. At its best, Unitarian Universalist theology is a public theology. So I wanna share some ideas this morning about how we can manifest our UU values in the public sphere. The first most obvious way is through direct political engagement and activism. I don't know how we could be a responsible faith without engaging in political issues. And this is one of our strengths. Consider these examples modeled by our congregations, ministers and denominational leaders. In Louisville, First Unitarian Church has opened its doors to protect people protesting police brutality and the killing of Breonna Taylor and David McAtee. Most UU church buildings are closed this year, but a minister recently pointed out that First Unitarian makes an exception for saving lives, and so they're open now. Unitarian Universalists have also gotten very involved with elections this year. I hope most of you have heard about the UU The Vote program, which makes it easy for UUs to sign up to make phone calls to prospective voters all over the country, focusing in particular locations where there have been efforts to disenfranchise people. We're following the tradition of black churches that have historically been political power bases and of voting rights leaders like Fannie Lou Hamer in Mississippi in the 1960s. I think UUs can sometimes be confused or hesitant about the boundaries regarding churches and politics, with particular concern about risking a church's nonprofit status. I think this is something worth being very clear and very well informed about, not just because we need to be careful about going too far, but because we need to make sure we're not timid about not going far enough. We're not allowed to endorse candidates or even ramp up our activism suddenly around an election in a way that has the effect of supporting or opposing a particular candidate. We can, however, and I'll go further and say that as you use, we should take public positions on issues that have relevance to our theology and serve to help hold elected officials and candidates accountable in general. For example, it's fine and necessary for you use to say unequivocally that we find it reprehensible for politicians to oppose or remain silent on issues like climate change, wealth inequality, and white supremacy, and to call out activities like voter suppression and misinformation that makes politics less transparent and more dangerous for vulnerable populations. Another way we can manifest our theology outside of our churches is by being bold in the way we live and express our new you values. I spent a good part of 2017 as a candidate for the US House of Representatives. At the beginning of my campaign, when I met with groups around my district, I initially thought I was sharing my personal campaign platform with them. Then at some point I realized I was preaching a straight up UU gospel. <laughs> Policy ideas were tied together by the notion that everyone has inherent dignity. My comments about how to heal our fractured public dialogue were informed by a sense that we're all connected and have a responsibility to each other. I found I was motivated to run to a large degree because my conviction that we need our Unitarian Universalist values modeled by more people in more places to fix the things that are broken in the world. I don't know that I was such a great candidate, but I became a better UU and I learned a lot about how to be a UU in public. Consider how you would feel making it clear to others that your perspectives on love and justice are informed by you being a Unitarian Universalist. Imagine how powerful it might be in the midst of so many people having it out on Facebook, if you made it clear that you encouraged everyone's spiritual growth and respect, respected their free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Debating those people who disagree with you, finding reasons to treat them as the other is easy. 
what kind of example might it set to embrace them all as brothers and sisters? We do have an election coming up. We find ourselves living at a time that increasingly disadvantages calls for equality and criminalizes political protests. That privileges notions of strength and power that center control even over public safety and human dignity. The website Choose Democracy is asking people to pledge to be willing, if necessary, to take a number of actions over the next few months to secure our system of governance. It's a sobering list. We will vote. We will refuse to accept election results until all the votes are counted. We will nonviolently take to the streets if a coup is attempted. If we need to, we will shut down this country to protect the integrity of the democratic process. Wow. Take this seriously. Search your soul right now for what you might be able and willing to do or won't do. Talk to God if that's your practice. If you're struggling emotionally, consider that this may be a time to reach out to friends family, maybe even a counselor or other means of support. At the same time, remember that we Unitarian Universalists have always had important work to do, and we always will. When, when we come out the other side, later this week, next week, next month, when we come out the other side, keep your sleeves rolled up. The world will likely still need you and your commitment and the precious gifts you have to give. Our struggle to improve our world won't take place or be decided over one election. I shared a quote at the beginning of my message that I said is often attributed to Martin Luther. If I knew the world would end tomorrow, I would plant a tree today. But while that quote is often attributed to him, it can't be found in his writings. As best we can tell, the first reference to it is found in Christian writings in the first half of the 20th century in Nazi Germany. And so as our nation has moved towards heightened nationalism over the past few years, it seemed fitting to share today. Yet if we are to be true to our UU mission, we need to be prepared for one of two outcomes of this election. One more ominous, the other a little less dire. But make no mistake that we'll have work to do either way. Dismantling white supremacy in virtually every area of American life, fixing the electoral process, campaign policies, and re redistricting rules, figuring out how to use our nation's resources to care for the health and well being of everyone, putting more of the abundant wealth that our nation generates into the pockets of more of the hardworking people who generate it undoing the convictions of people wrongly or unjustly incarcerated, making it harder for the wealthy lobbyists and corporations to influence elected officials, and walking our planet back from the precipice of a catastrophic climate disaster. It might serve us well to think of an election, even this election, not as an isolated opportunity to score a win for whichever candidate or party we support, but as a time for planting a tree, a tree that can shade and provide sustenance for all of us. When I was on the campaign trail, sharing UU values with a world that I believe desperately needed to hear them, I told many of the groups I met with that if people of faith and justice-minded people of conscience would only heed the call from the book of Micah in the Hebrew Bible to do justice and love kindness, and humbly engage in the holy work that we're called to do. We can change everything. What kind of a UU would I be not to bring the same messages to our own congregations? Do justice, love kindness, humbly engage in this holy work together. Today, tomorrow, definitely Tuesday, and every single day after that. May we be that strong. And know this week that I will be holding you tightly, 
tightly in prayer, love, and solidarity. Amen. And now I offer the following benediction, which has been used for years at the end of services at the UU Church in Charlottesville. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, and honor all persons. Go in peace. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle around to tend these bars. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within. Ten these.